the next uh, few times when you hear me preach, I'm going to be talking about anxiety. And I would like this verse to be a sort of theme for us. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I've got to acknowledge my sources in that the next few weeks I'll be uh, working from a book called Anxious for Nothing, Finding Calm in a Chaotic World by an author called Max Lucado. And I recommend it if you can get your hands on the book. It's an easy book to read and helpful if you're struggling with anxiety and you want to think about it and work through that. But maybe I'm going to give you the, the study guide at church on a Sunday and then you don't have to read the book at home. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 to 8, is a beautiful set of verses to go to if you're feeling anxious. Listen to this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Amen. So this book, Anxious for Nothing, is a book that my, my wife bought to read because we are feeling anxious with COVID and everything that's going on and the way that you have to teach at school. But another thing that happened at home was we got a new dog and that was also causing my wife some anxiety because he's very naughty and he chews everything and bites everything. And, and so she had this book, Anxious for Nothing, and one morning I was out in the garden and I found this book lying there, chewed by the dog. And I was in trouble. And so was the dog. But it's a reminder to us that although we can say something like anxious for nothing, the truth is that our anxiety is real. We are really anxious. We have gone through a lot as people all over the world and life is difficult. And one in four people suffer from anxiety and depression. And depression is one of the leading causes of death in the world. It's a terminal illness. Psalm 37 verse 8 says, Don't give in to worry or anger. It only leads to trouble. There's a difference between worrying and becoming overwhelmed by worry. And I think that's the point at which we find ourselves powerless against our worry and our anger and our anxiety. And it causes a lot of harm to our bodies. Now we live in a world that is full of stress. Your day starts, you wake up too early, you get to work by catching taxis or driving in the traffic, you stress all the time, however you're doing it, because you're worried you might get robbed along the way, you're worried you might have an accident, you're worried about being late. You get to work and there's anxiety all day as you look at a computer screen and, and people are saying you must be productive and you must get your work done and if you don't do it, you'll get fired and your whole life is on the line there because there aren't a lot of jobs. And then you get home and there's trouble at home and there's stress at home and you go to sleep and you don't sleep enough and you wake up again early in the morning and anxiety just builds up and builds up and builds up. Someone I was listening to said that, that naturally for human beings, if you think about the way anxiety is supposed to work, say we lived out in the, in the bush and we were hunting animals, you would get worried that the leopard or something was going to kill you and you'd run away and once you'd run away you'd celebrate and you'd say, okay, that's over, next thing to worry about. Or if you were going to hunt, you would catch something and, and you would 
take it home and celebrate and eat. But we have no room for celebration between each challenge. We, we just go from one challenge to the next challenge to the next challenge without ever stopping to say, thank you, God. I got through that one. So maybe next time you get to work, stop for a moment and say, thank you, God. I got here. I've got this little celebration, this little moment. And then the next little moment, maybe the next challenge, thank you that I made it to lunchtime. Thank you that I made it home. Thank you that I made it to bed. Just reminding ourselves of our achievements and not allowing the next anxiety to overwhelm us and overwhelm us and overwhelm us. But as we think about anxiety, we have the stress of getting to work of day-by-day -day life, which is stressful enough as it is. But in the last two years, we've had to deal with the COVID pandemic and all that that has had its toll on us. And one of the greatest causes of anxiety for any person is simply change. Anything that brings change causes an incredible amount of anxiety. So suddenly, you have to change the way you work. You have to change the way you go to church. You have to change the way that you socialize with your friends. Not only do you have to change those things, but there's some other severe changes where, where businesses close down and you found yourself unemployed and, and doing another job and then there was no time to say this is a difficult job because you're thinking, thank goodness I've got a job. Then on top of that, there's relationship problems and health problems. How many have delayed going to see a doctor when you should have gone to see a doctor because you were afraid of the hospital or, the, or, or what it might be? Then on top of that, there's been the loss of loved ones, and we haven't been able to, to celebrate their lives as we wanted to, as we needed to, because of the limitations of funerals at this time. And all of these traumatic events. So let's just say that, that the highest stress you could, you could go through is, is a number 10, a number 10 level of stress. And if you think that you could add stresses, but I don't think that stresses add. I think they multiply. But if you were to add them, you could say there's health problems and there's COVID and there's financial stress, and we give each of those three points and we've got nine points. But the problem is that the reality is you've got life under COVID, which gives you three points of stress. Then you've got health problems, you multiply that nine. And then you've got your financial stresses, you multiply it again, 27. You know what I'm saying is that your stresses multiply. And COVID is like having a magnifying glass on all the things that stress you out and you just can't see a way forward. So Max Lucado offers drawing on Philippians chapter 4 some points. He invites us to stay calm. C-A-L-M. Celebrate God's goodness. We're reminded of chapter of verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. A, ask for help. Think of verse 6. Let your request be made known to God. L, leave your concerns with him. Because we think of verse 6, as he says, with thanksgiving as you pray. And M, meditate on good things. Think about the things that are good. And I really welcome this positive affirmation that Max Lucado says at the beginning of his book. With God as your helper, you will sleep better tonight and smile more tomorrow. You'll reframe the, fa the way you face your fears. You'll learn how to talk yourself off the ledge. View bad news through the lens of sovereignty. Discern the lies of Satan and tell yourself the truth. You will discover a life that is characterized by calm and will develop tools for facing the onslaughts of anxiety. And so the first point of calm is C, celebrate God's goodness. And the verse, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. As we hear Paul saying such nice words, isn't that nice? Rejoice in the Lord. 
we can easily say, yeah, Paul, but you don't know what I'm going through right now. But I must remind you that Paul in Philippians is writing from prison. His life is under threat. His possessions are taken away and he has to beg for food and for anything that he needs to live with. And one thing about Paul is he maintains his faith. He is the one who writes in Romans chapter 8, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When Paul says rejoice in the Lord, he is reminding us that God is king. And the circumstances of our lives, the difficulty that we face, the, the, the challenges ahead of us are not the king. In Paul's day, Lord was a name for Caesar. But when Paul writes Lord, he means Jesus. And in 838, he reminds us that that Jesus means that there is love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we go through difficult times, when we go through a time like COVID, our thinking just goes around in circles and we become overwhelmed with our worry and we stop believing that a loving and good God created the world that we live in. And we start to only believe that the worst can always happen, only the worst can happen. And as we read the news, as we check our Facebook streams, as we get WhatsApps that tell you about people who are going to kidnap you and all of those things that, that bombard us 24-7, we start to think that only this can happen, only the bad stuff can happen. Rejoice in the Lord reminds you to look at God who is good and remember that good triumphs over evil, that God's love is always the last word. As we read the psalm this morning, Psalm 40, verse 1 to 2. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. One of the best antidotes when I'm feeling anxious is to go for a walk or a run or a bike ride and if I have time, I make my way down to the rocks by Onsaisi down there by Bloberg. And you stand on those rocks and you see these giant waves coming and they, they hit the rocks and they just fall back every time because they can't get past these giant rocks. And you might be impressed by the giant houses that are on the other side of the rocks. There's some lovely houses there. But those houses would not stand if it were not for the rocks that protect them from the sea. I stand on those rocks and I remember that my God is powerful, that my God is good. Sometimes if I have the time, I cycle up the mountains here and I look down on Tableview and I see this little church and my little house and the little places where all my life takes place and I remember how small it is compared to how great God is. Now, you don't have to go to these extremes like I do to see the beauty of God. If you're walking from here down Janssen's Avenue, just look up for a change and see Table Mountain in the distance. And think of that giant rock that stands there for thousands and thousands of years. A reminder that God is the rock on whom you can stand, the foundation of everything. It's so easy not to notice that mountain. It's so easy not to notice the ocean or the sky or the beauty of the world around us because we end up looking at our computer screens or drowning in our work, not looking up to see the power of God at work, not looking up to celebrate what God is doing. So the first step, see, celebrate God's goodness. Rejoice in the Lord always. Jeremiah witnesses the fall of Jerusalem. The place is a war zone. 
There has been death and violence and horror and, and everything is a mess. And he writes, this I recall to my mind. Therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. When we're going through trouble, we need to stop and remember what God is like. As the psalmist says, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. One of our causes of stress is our feeling of sinfulness. Whatever we've done wrong, whatever mistakes we've made, the devil amplifies those things so much that we feel we could never go to God with our troubles. We feel so bad that we think, well, I can't trouble God with my anxiety, I can't trouble God with what's going on, and the anxiety builds up and builds up and it multiplies and multiplies and becomes worse and worse. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. He waits for you to turn to him again and again and again. No sin is too much for him. No distance between you and God is too great for him to travel to you, to fetch you, to lift you up and put your feet on that rock, to set you straight. Think of the words of the prodigal son. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. That decision, that moment, is when everything changes. He returns to the Lord and the Lord welcomes him home. The father welcomes him. The father runs to meet him. The father puts a robe on him, makes him belong it's not too late, you are not too far. Turn to God and trust in God. Finally, I want to leave you with this illustration. Have you ever seen the Zip Zap Circus? The trapeze artists who swing on the ropes and they catch each other and they fly through the air. Have you seen these things? It causes me anxiety because I worry that they'll fall. But Henry Nowen tells of his visit to a family of trapeze artists known as, the flying, known as the Flying Rodleys. He asked one of the trapeze artists what their secret was. The secret is that the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. When I fly to Joe, my catcher, I have simply to stretch out my arms and hands and wait for him to catch me and pull me safely over the apron. The worst thing the flyer can do is try to catch the catcher. I'm not supposed to catch Joe. It's Joe's task to catch me. If I grab Joe's wrists, I might break them, or he might break mine, and that would be the end for both of us. A flyer must fly, and a catcher must catch. And the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the gift of anxiety. It actually keeps us alive when it's properly managed. It keeps us alert when we are in danger. It helps us to see what we ought to see and do what we ought to do. But when we are overly anxious, our minds become confused. We become aggressive and our bodies suffer. Our blood pressure rises and our relationships begin to fail. We ask, O oh Lord, that you'd help us to stay calm, that we'd celebrate your goodness, that we'd ask for your help, that we'd leave our troubles with you 
and meditate on good things. Lord, help us. Send your Holy Spirit of peace to give us the peace that we need to face the challenges that each day presents. And help us not to be overwhelmed by all that we are going through, but to put our trust firmly in you, like the trapeze artist who trusts the catcher, knowing that you do all the good work while we surrender to you. And so, Lord, this morning we pray, especially for those who suffer from anxiety. Give them your peace. And Lord, if we have family members and friends who are suffering, we ask that you help each of us to know how to care for them, how to love them, and how to reduce anxiety. If we are suffering from anxiety, help us to get the help that we need. And help us to find compassionate friends to listen, to understand, and give us relief. So Lord, be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Just uh, ask our stewards if there are any notices this morning.